All right, I think you'll find that institutions and growth sound strangely like praxeology, money, and entrepreneurship. Um, but we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Um, and since it's the joke now, make sure you fill out your evaluations. I had to do it the one last time, and, and I'm not Ben, he's doing, inst he's doing what, growth and freedom, and I'm doing institutions and growth, so um, I don't have anything to lecture about because Ben took it all, and, and so uh, I will talk about entrepreneurship and money, and no, I'm kidding, we'll talk a little bit about, this, I think this is the short version of this is rah-rah to Western culture and property rights is what this is. So that's what we're going to talk about today. My hoorah to Western culture and property rights. There's just some more people kind of coming in here. No, we're okay. Well, no, we're okay. I just there was a little rustling, so I'm just letting them get the rustling out of them. I do this. I do this for a living. There's a method to my madness. All right. Um, let me ask you. Let's start with this, and I'll just start. Does any any real quick questions that you think I can answer in a minute and a half, which is not possible, before we go on to this about other things? while you're standing here because we have I mean I could I have more than enough to talk about for like the next five days so we can we can we're gonna squeeze in as I said before my this is my hoorah to western culture and property rights um, and then Ben Powell's gonna come in and talk more about the empirical analysis we're gonna you're kinda gonna get the topic approach from two different things kind of a theoretical idea and then an empirical idea. Ben, Ben's going to do some discussion of freedom indices and some empirical stuff. And I'm going to try to stick a little bit to theoretical, a couple, mostly theoretical things, and we'll go from there. But has anybody got any real quick question before we start about anything that I might have said or didn't say before? And long as it's not too deep question about Bayesian priors and o overlapping, overlapping generations, equilibrium models, and st static dynamic. <laughs> Programming and and uh, heteroscedasticity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can't remember what you said. Restricted entrepreneurship, but uh, in a, in your previous talk on entrepreneurship, how do we foster that environment? Oh, you said it's not systematizable, not teachable. Right. So how then could we maybe create an environment where? Entrepreneurship flourishes and, and pops more often. That's a great. That's a great question, and it, believe it or not, it goes along with kind of the topic we're going to talk about. Is because one of the things that we're going to see, one of the places where growth really takes off, is where entrepreneurial activity is rewarded, or is is recognized, and and rewarded is kind of a tough word, but a better word might be not penalized. So another way to take this, and why I said this will just be like praxeology and entrepreneurship and money. Except it'll be, you know, it be all put together. Is if we're going to talk about growth and the institutions that lead to growth, one of those institutions is what? It, how is it that we encourage entrepreneurship, right? So, so that's a great question, and we're going to see. I think we'll see in some of this. We'll talk about some of the institutions that encourage that. So, I think I'll answer that question kind of as I go through. Uh, anybody else, real quick? Yeah. Okay, why, why, if these ideas are so cool, does nobody else want to come and play in our sandbox? Um, you know, I, I, and it's interesting because there's a difference between, you know, remember when your mom, you were little and your mom would say, do as, I, do as I say, not as I do? Well, I think the big thing here is, is we do as we do and not as they say. Right, I think I think the ideas you think about it. The, these ideas that I'm going to talk about here are largely are largely. If that's for me, I'm not here. Okay, 
Um, that's okay. Don't worry about it. It happens. It's, it, anybody who has a cell phone hasn't had it go off in a group, be the first to cast your cell phone at him. <laughs> okay? Because every one of you has had a cell phone go off when you're doing, everyone knows the cell phone dance, right? Right? We've all done the cell phone dance. Crap! And now you're all going, and now you're all going because his went off, you're all going, okay, mine. <laughs> and it's been hard for me because mine's been on vibrate, and yesterday's lecture it vibrated like five times. And you guys that have them know you're twitching because you want to just, let me just, let me just look. I see who? See who and, and since mine gets email, it's usually email, so I just, you know, uh, that's not, let's see, okay, that's, no, nah, I don't need to deal with that. Well, no, I might need, no, nah, I can take it. So. But you've all done the cell phone dance. It's a great question. I think, I think when we really think about the ideas, there's a difference between rhetoric and ideas or rhetoric and reality. And I think the reality of it is, is why you hear more people kind of, if you will, talking about it. One of, I think the, a better way to ask that question or a, a deeper question to understand, which is really difficult to understand, is why the bleep don't people recognize... <laughs> Why <laughs> believe don't people recognize that Western culture is way cool, right? We have stuff, and you know, we were talking about this the other day. When we talk about things, one of the people, all questions people ask when they begin to talk about growth or economic growth is they say, why are people poor? Right? Why are some people poor? Well, let's think about that for a minute. Well, really, let's not think about that for a minute because it's the wrong question to ask. In the history of mankind, right? Let's think about the history of mankind. Since man became man, however you think that happened, okay? I happen to be more on the end of the you know, evolutionary biology and the evolution deal. And if you think it was something else, that's cool too. It doesn't matter to me, okay? Um, but you think about how long man's been on this planet, okay? It's been a long, long time, hasn't it? Maybe not relative to the length of the planet, depending on, again, which origin you want to believe, but we'll leave that for a different day and a different discussion. But think about how long, and, and by the way, all of us are born into this world um, buck bleep naked with nothing, right? Seriously. It's all we would come into this world. But some of us are wealthy. The poorest person in this room right now is wealthier than the King of England was 200 years ago in many, many ways. Right? We were talking, Sheldon and I were talking about a story the other night about the King of England drinking wine in his castle in the winter and his wine is frozen and he can't drink it. Can any of you imagine being in a room that's so cold that you live in that you can't drink the drink you're drinking? None of you live in an environment like that. He had animals living in his castle. We have domesticated pets. We're not talking about he had a little dog. Hey, Rover, come over here. And he, you know, and, and Rover came over and he petted him. and screwed. We're talking about livestock. Okay? When he wanted to, say he wanted to have a, a show, he would, and here would come the minstrels, right? And they would play something and the court jester would come over. Well, I could go and get the court jester and the minstrels, like, here. <laughs> right? I go, court jester, there he is, look at that. I could watch TV on this, right? I go to Hulu, right? Click it up, boom, pop it in, go to YouTube. I can watch the court jesters bean each other in the head all day long. Right? Carrying this in my pocket. Imagine that. Right? Imagine. Think about that for a minute. Compare that to the king of England 300 years ago. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's pretty amazing. I mean, how many, when we talk about, you know, at that time when major events happen, how many of, them, how many of us see them unfold as they happen as if we were there? Technology, television, the internet now, all that stuff, we get to see those things as if they're happening right now. We can have conversations with people halfway around the world almost in real time, right, with slight latency delays. 
the king of England could have done that 300 years ago after he got on a ship, commissioned it, sailed around the, sailed around the globe, went around the Cape of Horn or the wherever it is down there in Africa, went over there and ended up in India and kept the port out and the starboard in or whatever it is for posh, right? Starboard home, and that's the myth about where the word posh comes from. And he gets there, and six months later, he can have a conversation with the dude running India, right? We could do that now, just like that, right? That's amazing. Now think about the history of mankind and think about what a small amount of time we've been able to do this on this earth. We're not even, we're not even a pimple, right? on the back side, right, of this animal when you think about how wealthy we are. How did that happen? Right? When we, we ask, we should, be, we should be in awe. What's the, what's the, who's got pencil with him? Who's got, give me pencil. Right? And he, the G.K. Chesterton quote is wonderful. I think it's right near the end. Is it near the beginning, the G.K. Chesterton Second paragraph. I got a. F My arms have gotten shorter over time. I don't understand that. Um, he says we are perishing for want of wonder, not for want of wonders. Most of us never step back and go, "Holy crap! I'm richer than the King of England was." In many, many, many ways. Most of us don't think about that, right? Mises, somebody grab me that human. Can you turn around? Somebody tall enough. See that human action right there? The green one? Can you grab that and pull it off for me? That one? Yeah. Somebody, she can't do it. You do. I just don't want to climb over you. Just grab that. That green one. Yeah, that'll work. While I'm talking, I'm going to look for another quote that I want. It's, it's near to end. <laughs> what happened? 900 and page 985, right? Mises says in the last paragraph, right? He says, um, The body of economic knowledge is an essential element in the structure of human civilization. Okay. The body of economic knowledge is, is an essential element in the structure of human civilization. It is the foundation upon which modern industrialism and all the moral, intellectual, technological, and therapeutical achievements of the last centuries have been built. It rests with men whether they will make proper use of the rich treasure with which their knowledge provides them, or whether they will leave it unused. But if they fail to take the best advantage of it and disregard its teachings and warnings, that's economics, right? They will not annul economics. They will not annul economics. They will stamp out society and the human race. That's a pretty powerful statement, right? In a, in a book that's supposed to be about positive. Remember I talked about economics as a positive science. The teaching, the theories of economics are apodictically true. Right? Demand curves are downward sloping apodictically true. Demand curves are downward sloping. We can talk until we're blue in the face and pretend that they're not. We're not going to annul the fact that they're downward sloping. But if we ignore that, we do it at our own peril. So the interesting thing is, is we have advanced. Western culture is the wealthiest culture in the history of mankind because it recognized the importance of these laws and allowed these laws to work. But further understand that these outcomes are not because any economists intended them, right? The wealth is the unintended consequence. Remember way back I talked about social phenomena? I told you I was just going to give the same lecture four times, just stick in different words, okay? It's the unintended consequence of the actions and interactions of individuals. So how did we get that wealthy, right? What is wealth? How did it happen? Okay, and that's important. So we want to understand why it is that we're wealthy. Why are some people wealthy? Not why are some people poor, but why are some people wealthy? 
Right? If we think about an economic system and we want to broaden this to world kind of things, there's, why, are, why do some system, systems engender wealth and some engender poverty? Is it really just bad luck that Cuba sucks? Can I say that? Is that okay? I mean, I hope I don't offend any, anybody with my language. I mean, if, I'm, if you're offended because I think Cuba's a horrible place, I don't really care. Okay, to be perfectly honest with you. Is it really a coincidence that Romania was a horrible place to be? Is it really coincidence that the Soviet Union was a miserable place to be? Is it really coincidence that in the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Bloc, they destroyed resources like it was their job? <coughs> Seriously. Because we hear that markets are destructive to the environment. Right. The, is it the Aral Sea, right, that the Soviets killed by strip mining around the end of it and the water runoff was so bad that the sea died? Does that happen in market places where market economies are and property rights are important? Because if you mess up my water, right, some of the best fishing in the world is in England, in rivers in England. You know why? Because they have what we call riparian rights. We have downstream rights to clean water. So there's incentive for us to keep water clean. Now, there's lots of trade-offs. If we let water get dirty, we get, you know, pollution is a necessary trade-off to get things. And that's a different lecture at a different time. Right? We can't produce things without pollution. At the very least, we know from the second law of thermodynamics, we're going to fill up the heat sink with pollution, with chaos, right? Second law of thermodynamics tells us the world becomes more entropic. And once everything, all the entropy is filled up and the sink is filled up, party's over. Boop. There's nothing we can do about it. Physics tells us that. Nothing we can do about that. But if we want to have growth and wealth and things like that, those are necessary, right? Those are necessary um, costs to those sorts of things. So again, we ask ourselves, why are, we, why are some people wealthy? Why are some people poor? Well, we talked earlier about property rights and the importance of property rights. We, so we want to understand first, what is wealth? Okay, what is wealth? If we're going to ask, talk about growth, we need to talk about what wealth is because then we need to know what growth is. Wealth is just things that we value. Right? Wealth is things that we value. Growth is an increase in the things that we value. That's what growth is. Soviet Union, right, the old joke used to be that the Soviet, they would have a quota for, you know, they, the, they would go into the factory and say, look, you're not producing enough shoes. And I'm sure these stories are more apocryphal than real, but they make the point. You go in and you say, look, you guys aren't producing enough shoes. So the guy would say, all right, we'll produce more shoes. We'll just all make them size 45. Right, and that's for my European friends, right? We'll just make them 45, and we'll just pump them out. Hey, look at all these shoes we made. We met the quota. Yeah, but they're all size 45. Well, you didn't say they had to be different sizes. You just said we had to produce a lot of them. Or the example about you guys aren't producing enough nuts and bolts. Okay, we'll make really teeny weeny nuts and bolts like this, and we'll make lots and lots of them. Go, no, no, that won't work. Here's what we're going to do. We'll make... We, now your quota is going to be by weight. Okay, right? And there's a famous old cartoon of a guy standing next to a big bolt. Right? He says, I met my quota and the bolt's like the size of this room. Well, <laughs> how good is that going to do, right? So we can produce stuff that's not valuable. Production is not valuable. Remember, leisure is a consumer's good. Leisure is a consumer's good. That means labor is a bad. Production for production's sake doesn't make us wealthy. Jobs for jobs' sakes don't make us wealthy. Because if you want jobs, for example, if you want full employment, I can guarantee you full employment. You to be fully employed for the rest of your life. It's really pretty easy. Okay? Those dudes over there, let's say we're, we live right here in Irvington, and we say those dudes over there in Connecticut, we just don't like those guys. Okay? They're on the other side of that river over there. And we've heard about them. I'm just not trading with them. Just think about it. If I quit trading with those guys, think about all the jobs I could create right here in New York. 
And we certainly aren't trading with those Pennsylvanians. And the Canadians are right out. <laughs> right? Terrence and Philip and the whole gang are out. Okay? Terrence and Philip are out. I love South Park, and I'm going to try not to do it because I just really like South Park a lot. It's as, it's as good as satire gets. Okay? It, it really is. And it's foul-mouthed and terrible and all that. Yes, it is. That's what makes it so good. Um, part of what makes it so good. So we're not going to trade with them. And the Massachusettsites, pff, they talk funny. Listen to those guys. Parking cars and talking about not voting and stuff like that. I mean, those guys are terrible, right? We don't, want, we don't want any part of them. So think about all the jobs we could create in New York. That'd be pretty cool, right? We wouldn't have to buy cars from people in Michigan. We could produce them right here in New York. We wouldn't have to buy tobacco from the, the leaves for the, our cigars from the dudes in, in Connecticut. We could grow it right here. Um, think about all the jobs we create. But, you know, come to think of it, those guys from Buffalo, they're pretty close to Canada, and I don't like those guys much either. I'm just going to quit buying stuff from Buffalo. So the Buffalo's out, right? I just And the Finger Lakes... Something about calling lakes after a hand. I, we can't trade with those guys either. So <laughs> think about all the jobs we could create. And by the way, while we're at it, those Terrytowners, what a rough bunch they are. Uh, we can't. <laughs> I mean, they got an interstate runs right through their town. We can't be trading with those guys. They're just a rough crowd. Right? So think about all the jobs we could create in Irvington if we just didn't trade with anybody. Right? And heck, why trade with anybody anything? I could make myself fully employed every day from the time I got up to the time I got in the morning. I would just quit trading with people. I'd be fully employed every day. I'd be wealthy as heck, wouldn't I? Remember when I talked about energy independence? It's the same argument. It's silly, right? For you philosophers, I just reducto ad absurdum, didn't I? You take, a lot, take an argument carried to its logical conclusion. If it's silly, it's a bad argument, right? It's a bad argument. It's one of the logical fallacies. So if we're going to be wealthy, remember one of the ways we said we'd become better off. Mutually, voluntary trade is mutually beneficial. <coughs> voluntary trade is mutually beneficial. So if I trade with you and you trade with me, I trade you my tick and you take my tooth, right? We're both better off. Huck Finn walks away, Tom Sawyer walks away, and they're both better off. They're more wealthy, aren't they? How many of you guys ever had your parents get a refrigerator or a washing machine and dryer delivered to your house? Was that the day when you were a kid or what? Because what did you have? You had a box. And that wasn't just the box, was it? I mean, that was days of fun, as long as it didn't rain, right? That was days of fun. We built a whole city out of that, dude. Houses, gas stations, grocery stores. I mean, we had a blast, and then if it was winter, we had sleds and tree forts and snow forts, and oh, I mean, it was great. Were we better off as kids when that happened? Yeah, we were more wealthy. It was trash to our parents, but it was wealth to us. We were better off. Why? Because there was an exchange made, okay? And that exchange is important. The other thing is, is when we're making exchanges and we want to, we, we've mentioned the word comparative advantage a bunch in here, right? And I think Sheldon gave you a quick example. Is that right? Okay. Adam Smith, and I, and I imagine the Wealth of Nations is around here somewhere. I won't dig it out and open it and read it. But um, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations starts off and basically says the division of labor is what leads to the Wealth of Nations. Economics was founded trying to answer this question. Right? An inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations is the beginning of this institutional Virginia school, Austrian, Hayekian, Misesian, Mangarian public choice venture, right? We're all doing, as Pete Betke says, we're all on the Smithian project. Ben, don't growl at me. 
Because you know it's true. No, huh? We're going to debate that later. Rothbardian project? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but we're all, the, the modern economics, the, the reputed father of modern economics is Adam Smith. Wealth and Nations. An inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth and nations. He wanted to understand why is it that nations are wealthy. Well, what was he reacting to? He was reacting to the mercantilist. Who were the mercantilist? The mercantilists were the guys that believed wealth was determined by the amount of gold in the exchequer. The king's treasury. So the more gold we had in the treasury, the wealthier we, wealthier we were, right? That was the mercantilist view. And you can go back and read a lot about the mercantilists and, and the, the fuggers and the frumps and all those guys and read their papers and all that kind of stuff. And, and they all believe that that's the way we did it. So what did they believe? Any, we don't want to trade with other people because if we trade with other people, what happens to the gold? It goes away, right? So if, I, if I'm an Englishman and I buy Spanish wine... I get wine and gold goes away. Well, gold just goes away, so we must be poorer. Smith was trying to understand, that, wait a minute, this doesn't, this doesn't really make sense because you know, I kind of like this wine. Right? This Spanish wine tastes pretty good. This Portuguese port is pretty good. And this stuff's all pretty good stuff. And we can't do it here in England. Heck, all we do is, you know, we're like the Irishman, right, Ben? We just boil everything and hope we can get it down. On the, on the way to eating something later, or drinking something later, right? But in all seriousness, if gold goes away, does that make us poor? Mercantilists believe that. Smith starts and says, now that's not where it comes from. The wealth in nations comes from the division of labor. Well, what's a division of labor? Well, the division of labor means that we're pursuing our comparative advantage means we're specializing according to our comparative advantage. So division of labor, specialization, and comparative advantage all mean the same thing. Well, what do they mean? Well, they come from, when I talked earlier about, I said, when I read you that sentence, it said, all social phenomena emerge from the actions and interactions of individuals who make choices after weighing costs and benefits to themselves. And I said that there were some implications there. Choice is important. Right? If you're not talking about choice, Ben, you're not an economist, right? If you're not talking about choice, you're not an economist. Individuals choose. That was our methodological individualism. The other important point was is individuals choose after weighing expected benefits and costs to themselves. That is, they act rationally. They weigh, we have goals. We have purposes, right? That was human action. Human action meant that we purposefully pursued goals by taking means, mixing them with ideas, and applying them to ends. So marginal benefit, marginal cost, if you will. A little bit more benefit, a little bit more cost. Right? One of the things, one of the great paradoxes, Smith did a lot of cool things, but one of the paradoxes he was never able to solve was what, it, it was what we call, depends on where you come from, either the water diamond paradox or the water bread paradox. I mean the bread diamond paradox. Right? A question was asked, and Smith did a big circle around this, but this is also important to this idea of comparative advantage and growth and in institutions, is why is it that water costs almost nothing, and if you didn't have it, you would die? Right? If we didn't have water, we would die. Right? You'd shrivel up after a while and die, get dehydrated and die. Diamonds, on the other hand, most of us could live without diamonds. Right now, in an all-guys school, I get to follow the diamond thing along because the women are shaking their head, and then I get to tell the guys about what diamonds are for, and we follow this path, and we all chuckle, and we say, even then, you know, diamonds, we could live without diamonds. It might not be a wonderful existence, but we could live without them, right? But why is it then that diamonds are very expensive and water is very cheap. Why is it that we pay a lot for diamonds and not a lot for water? And usually people go, oh, it's, diamonds are scarcer. Right? That's why we pay more. Right? They're more scarce. 
And then, as Murray pointed out, I think in, in uh, Man Economy and State says, well, mandrake root is pretty scarce too. <laughs> right? How much are you willing to pay for mandrake root? It used to be used for medicinal purposes, or so they said. Right? The old walking medicine. I don't know what, but so they call it in the South. Grandpa's got his bottle of walking medicine. Okay? So, scarcity's not enough, right? Scarcity's not enough. But you add with that the idea that the way we value is at the margin, meaning we value things by a little bit more and a little bit less. We can get an answer to the problem. When we talk about water, I know that most of you value water at doggone near zero. Probably just about at zero. How many of you got a glass of water sometime in the last day or two and let some of it run down the sink? Yeah. So guess what? At the margin, how much you value water? It's zero. Right? You let it go away. You didn't try to keep it. You got in a shower today and you let the water run for a while to get hot and you let it run down the sink, run down the drain. You didn't get in the shower, did you? You value water at zero. Under the circumstance you're under, that's the margin. Now, if you were in the middle of the desert, right, and I plunked down a glass of water and a glass of diamonds in front of you, I'm pretty sure I know which one you're going to pick up. But right here in this library, no, I know, I know which one you're going to pick up, okay? In the, middle of the, in the middle of this library, again, where Mises has stood and Hayek has stood and Rand has stood and Friedman has stood, it's really pretty cool just to be here, just to feel that. But anyway, in the middle of this library, and Sheldon Richmond has stood, <laughs> um, if I offered you that same thing, I'm pretty sure I know what you would take, Right? You'd all run away with the glass of diamonds in a heartbeat, right? In a heartbeat. So marginal evaluation is really important. Well, what's that got to do with comparative advantage? Well, when we make choices, we only value things at the margin. One of the other things I do, I told you about my line and up game yesterday. The other one I do, I, I don't have the picture, but there's a picture, and I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. There's two things, two bumper stickers, a bumper sticker and then a picture I saw. This one comes from Paul Hain in his book said, yeah, I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, eliminate, all government, wa eliminate government waste at all cost. He said, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Right? Think about it for a minute. If it costs $10 to eliminate a dollar worth of waste, does it make any sense to eliminate a dollar worth of waste? Probably not. We're probably better off with the dollar worth of waste. Okay? The other one is there's this picture I found that was on an economist's door. Not my current colleague, Ben, but the one that was in the office before her. Okay? And on this picture it said, if people were paid what they were worth, and there was a picture of a social worker, it said social worker, that's how I know it was social worker, and it said teacher, youth counselor, baseball player, okay? And they were all in automobiles. And the youth counselor, the teacher, and the social worker were in Cadillacs and BMWs and other luxury cars that were big, and they were little tiny in there, and the baseball player was crammed into a Yugo like this, okay? <laughs> And again, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. I didn't know whether he got it or not. In fact, I had candidates come in. I told you I gave them that. I gave them this test too. And I said, what is this picture? And they're like, oh, I don't. And one of them, I said, marginalist revolution, water diamond paradox. And she looked at me cross-eyed. Water diamond paradox. Oh, my God. We have economists that don't know what the water diamond paradox is. I'm kind of twitching and stuff. And we hired her. So we're in really good shape. So um, she didn't know how to get away from the, the hoard and didn't know about the water diamond paradox. So she'll get along really well with the other colleague that thinks there's no choice and demand curves are upward sloping. So I just hope we keep them away from, let them teach macro. <laughs> And I'm kidding for when this goes on the internet, please edit that part out. Okay. I guess it's out of the bag now, huh? Oh, well. Um, 
if we're going to value things at the margin and we're talking about growth and we're talking about that, the, another important point that we didn't make earlier I want to make again is about this idea of efficiency. We throw the word efficiency around like, like everybody understands its meaning, right? I, I sat with some English professors once and they said, um, why don't they bear it? Because in, in South rural South Central Virginia, we lose power relatively frequently, okay? which is annoying. Because then I, then I got to live like the king did 250 years ago, okay? And I don't like that. We get an ice storm, and the ice gets on. I mean, ice storms like you ain't ever seen ice storms, okay? I, I, ice that makes the snow here look like wimpy. Okay, when you're talking about half inch, quarter inch of ice around trees and trees are coming down because of the way all that and branches are breaking and co power's breaking. And he said, why don't they put all the stuff underground? It would be more efficient. <laughs> I said, really? And I didn't really want to bother with this conversation, but he pushed me. I said, well, efficiency depends on what your goal is, doesn't it? So it was, again, $1 to eliminate $10, $10 to eliminate a dollar. If we talk about efficiency, right, and we're going to talk about growth, we're going to be better off being efficient than non-efficient. We're going to see that efficient and comparative advantage and specialization and division of labor all mean roughly the same thing. What does efficiency mean? Efficiency means given a goal, given a goal, given an end, human action, I want to do it as cheaply as possible. That's what efficiency is. Without an end, efficiency doesn't mean anything. Right? Even to a physicist, any physicist in the crowd, how do we define efficiency in physics? Anybody know? It's not energy out over energy in. We know that, right? Because for us, for the people who understand laws of conservation, what does that have to equal? One, right? All the energy that goes in has to come out. So, so in a physics definition, how do they define it? Work out over work in, right? Work out over work in. Well, what does work mean in physics? Okay, force times distance. What does that mean in English if I ask you to mean it in English? It means moving stuff, right? That means making the locomotive go from here to there. Why did I want the locomotive to go from here to there? Oh, because I had an end, right? So even from a physicist standpoint, it appears that it's purely mathematical, purely physical. It's an evaluative term. Because work means useful work, right? Because I can define the energy that dissipates with the same concept, right, of work. It means use, the, the word that's missing in front of work is useful work out. Which means efficiency is always and everywhere an evaluative term. So that means for something to be efficient, we're talking about evaluation. Who evaluates? Human beings evaluate. When do they evaluate? When they make choices. Where do they make choices? At the margin. All this stuff fits together. What is comparative advantage? Well, comparative advantage means finding something you're efficient at. It means you can do it cheaper than other people. Again, the fat kid doesn't play center field. Right? Even if the fat kid is a better center fielder than the center fielder is, who's a little skinny whippet kid, he's probably a better catcher too. So guess what? At the margin, compared to that guy, he's a better catcher. Anybody ever hear of Babe Ruth? Kind of an American icon. I think he played a game with a stick and a ball, and they ran around the bases, and he ran like that. He's, okay. But Babe Ruth, do you know, anybody know what Babe Ruth did before he hit home runs? He was a pitcher, wasn't he? Anybody know what his lifetime ERA was? 2.31. He had 100 wins and 23 losses or something there about. You can look it up. Over like a four-year, five-year span. He was one of the greatest pitchers of his time. Yet in 1919, he never pitched another inning, well, for all intents and purposes. 
Why? Because he had a comparative advantage at hitting, right? He was a better hitter relative to everybody else than they were pitchers compared to him, or hitters compared to him. So the other guys were relatively better pitchers, right? They were relatively better pitchers. So what did they do? They pitched. What did he do? He hit. So guess what we got? More home runs. More runs, more wins than what we got if he had pitched. Okay, let me draw a real quick example. I hadn't planned on doing this, but I'm going to do this. one of my favorite examples to help us understand comparative advantage. Ben, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from as much here. If I start doing, give me the high sign. All right. I know you won't talk about this. I'm going to let somebody be king for the day real quick, and we're going to assume, let's imagine a world where there's only three people in the world. Let's call them Ann and Ben and Cal, okay? And they each can produce two goods, material goods or spiritual goods, okay? They can produce one or the other or some combination of them. For you guys that know the Hain book, you'll remember this before Betke screwed it up and got rid of the example, okay? I said that so he could hear me. Oh, it's not being recorded anymore. Damn, I got the bad mouth in my colleague thing, though. All right, so we got Ann, Ben, and Cal. Okay, let's move Ann over here a little bit. Ann. They can produce material goods or spiritual goods. Okay. Ann, if she works her little fingers to the bone, works hard all day, and only produces material goods, can produce eight of them in a day. Okay. She works all day, fully employed. Okay, doesn't trade with anybody, is, is material good independent. Because after all, I want to be in Virginia, citrus fruit independent. Think about all the citrus jobs I could create in Virginia. Think about it. Nobody would ever be unemployed again in the citrus industry in, in Virginia. And we all know them, Florida, we don't want those Florida oranges anyway. We all know about those people from Florida. <laughs> They're just displaced New Yorkers. <laughs> Similarly, if she worked or if she was spiritually independent, she could produce four spiritual goods or any combination between. So that means if I drew a picture of what she could do, the fancy term for this is a production possibilities frontier. Anybody hear that before? Okay. Her production possibilities frontier would look like this. Okay. And she could be anywhere on there. So like she could do six and two. So if she wanted a spiritual good, right, if she wanted one spiritual good, she could produce one and she'd give up. She could do, I'm sorry, be six and one. So she could get six material and a spiritual if she wanted to be spiritual at all. Ben, he could do three of each. Same thing. If he were material good, independent, just did that. So he's got like this. Everybody good so far? Trying to keep the, the arithmetic to a minimum. Okay. We because we know how Austrians are with arithmetic, right? The only numbers they want in their paper are the page numbers. Right, Ben? <laughs> that annoys the heck out of me. But anyway. Cal, Cal, he's the bomb, okay? Cal, if he works his little fingers to the bone, can do one material good, okay? And two spiritual goods. Okay? So Cal, he got an itty bitty tiny PPF, okay? <laughs> All right, now, who wants to be king of Ann, Ben, and Cal land? King or queen? You want to be the queen? You're the queen of Ann, Ben, and Cal land. Here's what I want to know. Suppose we want to produce one material good so we can eat and live and survive but we'd like as many spiritual goods as possible. As many spiritual goods as possible and one... Let's make it the other way around. Let's do as many material goods as possible and one spiritual good. Let's do it that way. Okay. We'll do it that way instead. One spiritual good and as many material goods as possible. Who are you going to have produce the spiritual good? Queen. 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 You're not Queen Isabella. Queen Lisa. 
That means I need King Bart somewhere, I guess, for you, the, the Simpson generation. What do you think? One spiritual and as many material as we can get. Right? One spiritual, as many, because we've got to keep mind and soul together, but we're, we're kind of materialistic in this, in this little Ann Ben Cal land. And I have to pick. One of those people are going to be the one to produce the spiritual good. Who do you pick? I got some cows. Anybody want to go with Ann? Nobody likes Ann? To, make, to do the spiritual? The spiritual. The spiritual. Spiritual. Ann, you're going with Ann? You want Ann? Anybody want Ann? No. You're going to go with Ann? Well, we can find out. Let's, let's find out. I mean, it's not... Let's say we have Ann or Ben or Cal do it, okay? And here's the spiritual and the material. So let's suppose we have um, Ann do the spiritual, the, the spiritual good. So we won't have them do any, okay? How many material goods could we get if we have... And do that. Well, these guys are easy, right? We could do uh, one, three, and if she does spiritual, what does she do? Six, six right? She does six. So we get ten, right? One and ten. Pretty good, huh? Lots of people are shaking their heads. Some people are going, yeah, go for Ann, right? Look at Ann. She's the best. Look at how efficient she is. She can do four in a day. Anybody want to go believe it should be, it should be Cal? I got some Cal so we can do this. Have Cal do it. If we have Cal do it, if we have Cal do it, what do we get? Out of her, what do we get? Eight. Out of him, what do we get? Three. Three. Out of him, what do we get? Half. What the heck is going on? Cal, man, look at that. He, they, we can barely even see his PPF, right? <laughs> We can barely see his production possibilities frontier, can we? It's tiny. Anne, on the other hand, look at this. Anne, Anne has got a, a big, right? It's way out here. Okay? It's way out here. Yes? How come it is that Cal is better at that? Well, let's, let's think about opportunity cost for a minute. I told you I'd give the same lecture just over and over and over again. We just changed the words a little bit, right? Let's think about opportunity cost for a little bit. What's the opportunity cost of Anne of producing a spiritual good? If she produces one spiritual good, what does she have to give up? She has to give up two material goods, right? So her opportunity cost is two material goods. How about Ben? He's one. How about Cal? It's only a half. Who's the most efficient producer of material goods? Or, I'm sorry, spiritual goods. Cal is, isn't he? Because he, he gives up the least. So who do we want to do this? Now let's suppose we were Ann. Ann and Ben together and we said, you know what, we don't like Cal. We're going to be spiritual good independent. <laughs> what would happen to us? We'd be poorer, wouldn't we? I want to be citrus fruit independent in Virginia. <laughs> Understand, when you ask for energy independence, what are you asking for? I want to be poor. Now, I don't want to be poor. Some of you might say, well, hold your breath, stomp your nose, and say we need national security issues. Okay, fine. Understand, you want to be poorer. Are you willing to be poorer to do that? I mean, there's no way around it, right? Are you willing to be poorer to do that? 
Because if you don't trade with him, you're poor. Look, I just showed you. Right? You're poor if you don't trade with him. You won't get as many of these. You can still get your spiritual good, but you won't get as many of these. That makes you poorer. Assuming, of course, material goods are valuable. Which I'm sort of guessing they are because we're making them and using them in my little economy where there's only two. Okay? What would happen if we did it the other way around? Suppose I ask you, we want one material good and as many spiritual goods as possible. What would you pick? Would you go with Ann or would you stick with Cal? One, one material one material and as many spirituals we can get. So if we look similarly, Anne's marginal cost or opportunity cost of a spiritual good, right, of a material good is half a spiritual. This will be one and this will be two. So if we wanted to produce material goods, what should we do? Have Anne do them. If we look, Anne is better at both things than anybody else, right? She can do more, but at the margin, she's, she can't do, she's better off trading with Cal, right? So if you're a big, giant, wealthy Anne, it might make sense to trade with a little, kind of poor Cal, right? Because Cal ends up better off. Ends up, ends up better off, and we become wealthier. And we've made voluntary exchanges. And now in the market, what's going to happen is we don't have to have Queen Lisa to determine who's going to do what, right? Now, in this world, we saw how might difficult it might be to pick the right person with three. Can you imagine trying to pick the winners with four, five, 80? 100, 300 million, 350 million, 5 billion, right? That's why Hayek called that the fatal conceit, right? That we could know what these things are. How do these things get determined? How do we know what they are? The market is a discovery process. I told you, I'm just giving the same lecture, just putting in different stuff, right? The market is a discovery process. Who helps us to discover our comparative advantage? Entrepreneurs. If we allow them to do what? Keep their profit. If they can keep their profit, is it in their interest to pay attention to what it's in their interest to pay attention to? If they can't keep their profit, is it in their interest to pay attention to what they can pay attention to? Probably not, right? My wife called yesterday mad at me. Every time my son does something stupid, she yells at me. I, know, I fully understand this. And she says, you're not going to believe what your idiot son did. So I said, I was thinking, try me. I'm sure I will. Okay. So I said, just quiet for a while. She says, he had to buy a bathing suit to be a lifeguard, and the, and the people he was gonna, were going to pay for half of it, and it was a $30 bathing suit, and bark, bark, yap, 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 something, 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 something. <laughs> then the bathing suit was not the one, it's the one with the lining in it, right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? You got the little lining in the bathing suit, okay? He doesn't like the lining. So he wants a lining cut out. So he cuts the lining out of the bathing suit before he tries the bathing suit on. Okay? And my wife says, I don't know why he does that. And I'm thinking, I just gave a lecture on rationality and I know exactly why he did that. So she says, I don't know why he does dumb stuff like that. I said, well, just have him pay for it. Right? I can't just have him pay for it because if he pays for it, he's not going to have any money, and then he'll ask for money when he goes back to school, and I'll just have to give him the money anyway. 
I said, there's your answer, <laughs> right? Thankfully, I didn't say it in a way she heard me or and made it intelligible. <laughs> and I was quiet for a little more, and then she said, oh, I'll talk to you later, and hung up the phone, right? He reacted to the incentive that he was faced with, right? What's the incentive he's faced with? He doesn't have to pay, right? If he doesn't have to pay, what's he going to do? React in a way that he doesn't have to pay, right? Incentives matter, right? Incentives matter. Entrepreneurs in a market help us find those incentives. They help us to determine that cow has a comparative advantage at spiritual goods. And if we allow Cal to find his comparative advantage because we let him keep the profit he earns from that, everybody's going to find their comparative advantage and we're going to produce efficiently. So what kind of institutions do you think are important for discovering comparative advantage? Fee. Fee. That's a good, that's a good answer. <laughs> but I mean more bigger institutions. You say markets are important, right? Because prices... Right, relative money prices will tell us about incentives, right? Because remember, again, Adam Smith said the wealth of nations comes from the division of labor, right? This is a division of labor. We're going to have Cal do this, Ann and Ben do this, and whether what we have, um, and whether what we have Ben do depends on some other things that I won't get further into this example because this example is really cool. There's a lot of things we can do with it, okay? Um, Markets are going to help us to discover that. Well, what's important for markets? Markets require what? Market is nothing more than exchange, right? It's where exchanges take place. And exchanges take place at terms, right? That's why when I told Ben, you've got to trade me spots, he goes, what are we trading for? Right? I'm not getting anything in return. Well, this isn't a trade, right? So he liked the word swap better. So, right, we swapped, right, or rearranged, Okay. Well, okay, he didn't like it, but he liked that word better, okay? And in a way, he's right. We didn't make a trade, right? Ben, the other dictator, said, you come over here, and we'll give you 14 extra gin and tonics. And he said, I'm in, right? So it did turn out to be a trade, but... <laughs> Powell, by the way, we're, we're, we haven't been, I, he's a terrible guy. So, <laughs> so if we're going to make trades and trades are going to make us more wealthy, how, do we, how can we make trades and then profit from our trades? What's the most important institution there is? Private property rights. Without private property rights, can we trade? There's no exchange without private property rights, is there? If there's no exchange, then we can't discover comparative advantage, can we? If we can't discover comparative advantage, can we have a meaningful division of labor? We don't have a meaningful division of labor, right? When the, when the, when the father coaches the eight and nine-year-olds and his kid's the fat kid and he's playing shortstop, that tells you there's something else going on, right? Right, because fat kids don't play shortstop either. What do fat kids do? They catch and they play first base. Sometimes they pitch, okay? But they ain't, they ain't playing shortstop and they ain't playing center field, okay? Something else is going on. But in all seriousness, without property rights, we don't get exchange. Without exchange, we can't discover our comparative advantage. Without comparative advantage, can we have a division of labor, specialization, <laughs> Can we specialize? We can, but is it meaningful? Right? How do you know what your comparative advantage is? You discover it. How do you discover it? Right? I go and I start to do, like say I want it to be a, a, an NBA basketball center. And I go out into the world of trying to be an NBA basketball center. And bigger, taller guys are hitting me in the top of their, my head with their elbows. And I can't jump very high. I don't get very many rebounds. What have we learned? It's very costly for me to play center, right? I might want to stick with hockey. 
Because hockey, I don't have to jump. Right? <laughs> the point is, in hockey, you want to keep your feet on the ground. Okay? So I probably have a comparative... I mean, you might. Here, here's another interesting question while we think about this kind of comparative. I was going to pose this to Ben being a good uh, Bostonian that he is. Who's a better athlete? And this is just an aside that popped into my head. Who's a better athlete, Michael Jordan or Danny Ainge? Danny a Who's Danny Ainge? Okay. Everybody knows who Michael Jordan is, right? He's a pretty good basketball player. He's okay. I mean, he got a, won a couple of trophies or something, some with a ball on top and some net or something in some minor league somewhere. I don't really remember. No. Right? Michael Jordan, you know, the greatest basketball player beside Larry Bird that ever lived. <laughs> that was for Ben. Well, and for me, too. And let's not count Wilt Chamberlain. Because he was pretty good, too, right? At lots of things. But, well, that's a different story, right? <laughs> um, Danny Ainge was an NBA basketball player. How many championships did he win? A couple, two with the, with the Celtics, okay? Danny Ainge was also a big league ball player. Played Major League Baseball with the Toronto Blue Jays. Michael Jordan tried to play professional baseball, right? What happened to him? He hit like 180, right? They were going to start calling the Mendoza line the Jordan line, right? Danny Ainge and Michael Jordan both play golf. Danny Ainge is a scratch golfer. Michael Jordan is not. Who's a better athlete? I would submit it's Danny Ainge. But if I want a basketball guard, which dude am I hiring? Michael Jordan, right? It really doesn't matter whether Danny Ainge is a better athlete, right? Danny Ainge, and this is Ann, right? Here's Ann. Here's Michael Jordan. Now we need a basketball team. Ready, go. Who do you want? Michael Jordan, right? Because he has a comparative advantage. How did we discover that comparative advantage? In the market, right? Through and in the market process. Why? Because we allowed him to make profit. We allowed others to make profit by hiring him. Private property rights are the sine qua non, right? Are the sine qua non for wealth. Why is Western culture so cool? And all the other cultures and organizations throughout the history of the world, where did property rights first get recognized? Private property rights. Western culture, right? I would submit that the most important document ever written in the history of the world is what? Anybody want to guess? The Magna Carta, right? Because that's the beginning to the end of what? Arbitrary kingship, the nobleman, right? Now, Magna Carta only gives noblemen's rights, right? It doesn't give peasants' rights. But the nobleman rights to be away from their king is the beginning of the peasants' rights, which is the beginning of the Enlightenment period, right? It's beginning of the understanding in the Enlightenment of that individuals matter. Personal autonomy matters, right? I know I'm stealing some of Sheldon's stuff from the first night, but combine it with the economics we've done, because we keep getting the question about, the, you know, libertarian economics, right? Which is a useful question, important question. Why do why do, why are there so many why are Austrians libertarians why are why do a lot of economists tend to be more free market than other well if you understand this idea of a comparative advantage and you understand the importance of comparative advantage in growth and in wealth wouldn't you like to be in a system that recognizes comparative advantage right how many of you actually read pencil after I told you to read it good. Was I wrong? It's great, isn't it? And what's it about? It's about discovering comparative advantage. It's about discovering the idea of, of freedom, of free institutions. And in those free institutions, we discover our comparative advantage, we divide labor, we specialize, and we grow. Right? There was a question over here uh, that said, why are some, yesterday said, why are some professions paid more in different countries than others, right? The, one of the answers is, is in the countries where comparative advantage is recognized, 
and allowed to flourish, generally professions will be paid more, other things equal. Why? Take a barber. Why are barbers paid more now than they were 15, 20, 25 years ago? They're still doing the same thing, right? Sit down, or in my case, right? My barber, I, I actually, I don't do a barber anymore. I do the salon thing, and Terry cuts my hair. It's, but Terry just, she likes to cut my hair. It takes her no time. Clip, 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 get out of here, right? It's real easy. Why do I pay her more than I would have when I was a kid? Right? Interesting question. She's not doing anything different than the guy who cut my ear when I was a little kid did, right? It's the same deal, right? I wasn't traumatized by that at all, I promise. Right? Not at all. But why, you know, it's an interesting question. Well, one of the, one of the answers is we recognize comparative advantage. Well, the other answer goes back to Ben talked about cycle theory this morning, right? Business cycle theory, business cycle, macro theory, cycle theory, right? Talking about business cycle theory. What's the other thing, another, another thing that's important to the question of, or, or to the answer of why people have economic growth? One is private property rights. Another is we believe in the rule of the law. We had a wonderful conversation this morning about over breakfast over rule of the law. Does everybody know what rule of the law means? Rule of the law means that the law applies equally to everybody. It means that there aren't some laws apply to you, some laws apply to me, or this law applies differently to you than it does to me. Right? We don't get like in history of the world, we don't get to say it's good to be the king, right? The rules apply differently. Now we all know that that's not always true and we have some problems with that. We won't get into that. It's a serious issue. But in the five minutes I have left, right, five? Um, we, we can't get too deeply into that. But one of the important things is rule of the law. What do we mean by rule of the law? Well, we don't want arbitrary property rights. Stable property rights are important. Anybody ever play Monopoly? Okay, we all play, everybody knows Monopoly, which is, that has nothing to do with markets, by the way. So if anybody tells you the way to learn about markets is play Monopoly, I call Bravo Sierra. Okay? <laughs> Imagine you play Monopoly, okay, and by the way, how many of you put the tax money and the other stuff on free parking and then pick it up when you land on it? That's against the rules. <laughs> the formal rules, right? But it works, doesn't it? We all play it. Nobody cares. That's, oh, that's the way we play? Okay, that's cool, right? But it's against the rules. That's why it's called free parking. It's not called parking and pick up a welfare check. <laughs> <laughs> it's called free parking, okay? But imagine if you were going to play Monopoly, and every time you went around the board, we had another wheel. We had two wheels, and we spun them, boom, and they had the colors of the, you know, the green, the blue, and the purple, and the light blue, and the yellow, and the brown, and the bright. We had two wheels, and we spun them, right, like that. And then we matched the colors. So now Park Place is Baltic. And every time we go around, we spin them like that. So we change the val, we change the places. Now we just change the cards, the values on the cards, the numbers on the card. Every time you go around, and on top of that, we have another guy who's spinning a different wheel that tells us whether we'll collect 200 this time, or we'll get 200 taken away, or landing on gold gets you double your income. Right? We all play that one too, right? That's not in the rules either. Okay, those those are called memes, by the way. Thing, it's not in the rules, and we're from all over the country, and we play that game. And the guys know that you play doorknob, too, right? All over the country. It doesn't matter, right, where you're from. Okay, I'll leave it at that for those that don't understand, and we'll move on very quickly, okay? <laughs> but imagine if we played every time we went around a Monopoly, the rules changed. Would you want to be involved in that game? It would be very difficult, right, because you your expectations would be screwed up. So stable property rights are incredibly important. If the property rights, which are the fundamental rules of the game, change every time you play the game, or every day they change, 
How difficult would it be for you to plan and have a planning horizon? How difficult would it be for you to buy and use capital? Because what's capital represent? Capital represents plans. Plans of entrepreneurs to produce things later. Right? That's all capital is. It's plans embodied in physical goods, the plans to produce things later. That's what capital is. If we're changing the rules all the time, how much capital are we going to get? Probably not very much. Is capital important for growth, do you think? Why do barbers get paid more? Because we have more capital in this country than a lot of other places do. Why do we have more capital? Because we have stable property rights, relatively stable property rights, compared to most of the rest of the world. Why are we wealthy? Why is Western culture wealthy? Because it recognized the importance of stable rules, in particular, stable property rights. So stable property rights become important. Right? The, and at some point, it used to be believed that all you needed was lots of resources. Now we call that the resource curse, right? Just because you have lots of natural resources doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy. If you have lots of natural resources and really crummy property rights, and Ben's going to take up some of these issues empirically tomorrow, how much growth do you think you're going to get? Probably not very much at all, right? There's lots of countries with lots and lots of natural resources that are very poor. Okay. On top of that, some other things that are important is, again, as we said, specialization. We have to have the, we have, to have the ability to make exchanges. Um, Technological innovation is important. That is entrepreneurship. Where does entrepreneurship come from? Stable property rights and the ability to keep your profit. An educated populace is important. Where does an educated populace come from? Stable property rights because I know if I spend my time getting educated, I'm going to get to use my education later. If I don't believe I'm going to get to use my education, that is my human capital labor, how much of it would I invest in? You'd be better off taking leisure, wouldn't you? Because who doesn't like leisure? I love leisure. Don't tell anybody here that's paying me to do this that this is leisure for me, okay? Shh. Right. Again, to finish, the wrong question to ask is why are we wealthy? I'm sorry, why are we poor? 